All right, for today's lesson in physical materials, we're going to be discussing the different kinds of nuclear weapons that have been made, how to make them, uh, what the engineering was that went into them, why the designs were different from one thing to another. There were four that we talked about, four types that we reviewed or like did a preview for last time. They are uranium bomb, a plutonium bomb, a hydrogen bomb, and a dirty bomb. So uh, which one? Uh, what's the best place to get science news for the layman? That I don't really know. I just, you know, if it's astronomy, space.com is pretty good. Um, Ars Technica is pretty good. So, anyways, here we go. Let's start with uh, let's start with a dirty bomb because that one will be the, I guess, the most straightforward. So a dirty bomb, this was something that came up in the early 2000s after 9-11 happened and they're like, oh, maybe Al-Qaeda is going to make a dirty bomb and take it to Chicago and it's going to blow up and it's going to cause all sorts of problems. Um, the idea behind a dirty bomb is that you assemble a truck like this. Here's your truck. Okay, you have a cab. It's got wheels. Okay, and then you would fill this truck with some radioactive substances. So here's your radio radioactive substances and you pack it full of like fertilizer or something like that. So fertilizer and oil and some radioactive substances. And then you uh, park this truck somewhere in, at the time the concern was that it would happen in Chicago, but um, everyone was concerned that this would happen. And so then you blow up this truck, here's the truck, and it disperses all this radioactive stuff in some vicinity. So you look down at the city blocks, here are the city blocks, and you park the truck right here at a corner and then it blows up and then it contaminates a part of the city and makes it uninhabitable because all of this nuclear material has been spread throughout the area. And the reason it would be, um, it's not the explosion that was the concern, um, although that is what happened in the 1990s. I assume everybody remembers the 1990s Oklahoma City bombing. Uh, what was it, 1995? 1995. This was the Oklahoma City bombing, uh, Oklahoma City bombing that took place at a federal building. Um, it was a a moving truck, right? It was like a a rider truck or something like that, um, or a U-Haul type truck. Um, I don't know the brand, not that it really matters. And it was filled with fertilizer. It was a big fertilizer bomb that went off. Um, in the 1990s. I was living out of the country, but I was with someone who was from Oklahoma City and his dad worked around the corner and his parents like sent him an article and said, this bomb went off and they didn't, he did, they didn't report everyone's okay. Anyways, so that's what happened here in the 1990s. So you would put in with your bomb, you would have this radioactive material and then that would get dispersed around. That was the concern um, at the time. And it the main damage would not be um, the explosion, although you can clearly see that the explosion does cause a lot of damage. The main concern would be that it then contaminates this whole region of downtown, you know, maybe for several blocks. Um, so you have, not only do you destroy the building you're in, but you render uninhabitable all the buildings in the vicinity. Um, and the challenge with this, uh, the reason that it ultimately is not as big of a concern as was once anticipated, is that in order to get a bomb with sufficient radioactive material that it would contaminate, like render uninhabitable a large portion of the downtown of a large city, uh, you would have to, you know, so you have all this radioactive material collected, you wouldn't be able to drive the car. You would be, you would suffer from radiation poisoning, so you would basically kill yourself through radiation poisoning um, within uh, minutes or seconds. And so the very process of assembling a bomb like this would kill the people that assembled it and kill the driver before he could get in location. And so a dirty bomb is not really a, an effective means of terrorizing an area because bringing all this radioactive material in here, it's emitting those uh, high energy particles in all directions all at once, and you would kill the driver before the driver could even start the car. So that's not... Um, a concern. These dirty bombs are not concerns. Uh, the reason is that you just can't concentrate that much radioactive material in a given spot um, without killing the people that assemble it together. This is very different than what happens with um, a bomb that's made out of like uranium or plutonium because the stuff that you would make a dirty bomb with, you would make it with radioactive elements that have fairly short half-life so that you get a large amount of radioactivity. 
So you would have to have some radioactive substance like strontium or iodine, um, cesium, something like this, that one of these isotopes that has a short half-life, something like, you know, a hundred years or a few hundred years. And then you would bring these things together and make your bomb. If you just made it out of uranium, just like uranium that's in the ground, there's already uranium in the ground. Uh, the amount of uranium in the ground is not trivial. Uh, you get something like um, a cubic centimeter of uranium for every cubic meter of ground, something like, of dirt uh, in the United States. The United States has a fairly high concentration of thorium. Um, it's not as, not as high in uranium as like uh, Australia. But the dirt has uranium in it. Um, the reason that uranium isn't the concern is because uranium has a very long half-life of like a billion years, so 10 to the 10 years, as opposed to 100 years. So if you have this stuff that decays in 100 years, it's going to decay rapidly, which means it's emitting a lot of material, emitting a lot of subs of uh, the gamma rays and alpha particles and things like that. So these ones are decaying rapidly, which makes them dangerous. These ones, uranium is decaying very, very slowly, which makes it not dangerous. In order to get uranium to explode, you have to have a different mechanism to do it. And it is not through radioactive, radioactive decay with a dirty bomb. So that's a dirty bomb. That's what it looks like, and it doesn't work. All right, there are some questions here. Um, are there mathematicians working in astronomy? Yes, there are. Uh, and the fertilizer so that imitates everything smell bad. It could, it could make everything smell bad. Why would it be hard to get radioactive material for a dirty bomb? Asking for a friend. Uh, would it be hard to get radioactive material for a dirty bomb? Um, is it hard to get radioactive material for a dirty bomb? Uh, yeah, I mean, it would be expensive. I don't know that it would be particularly hard. Uh, I'll give you an example. Americium-241. Um, Americium-241 is used in every, like smoke detectors have an element of Americium-241. It's $1,500 per gram. So it'd be expensive. You'd have to pull it all out. Americium actually has a long half-life as well, kind of like uranium half. It's not quite as long as uranium, but it would not be a good example. You'd have to get one of these things either from an accelerator or from, what, like spent nuclear fuel. Um, and you would have to process that spent nuclear fuel. And in order to process the spent nuclear fuel, it'd be cheaper just to process unspent nuclear fuel to make a regular bomb. So it, like the engineering just doesn't work in favor of this. So this is not something to be concerned about. Uh, let's see. Question. Is emitting rapidly equal to emitting much energy? So the amount of energy per decay, so when a uranium spits out an alpha particle and when one of these other objects spits out a particle, they're basically the same energy. Uh, it's the rate the energy is leaves the system that's the concern. And so the, the shorter the half-life, the quicker the decays happen and the more energy is radiated away at a given time. So long half-life stuff is relatively safe. There's ambient uranium um, in the ground, but the short half-life stuff, like shorter than a thousand years, um, those, if you have a large enough sample, will be, de be decaying so rapidly that you can get radiation poisoning from it. A guy made himself sick by, yeah, you'll make yourself sick because you're collecting a bunch of an americium source. Americium has a shorter half-life than um, uranium. Okay, so the next thing we'll talk about, let's go on with a uranium bomb. So a uranium bomb uh, is what, there were two bombs that were dropped um, in World War II. There was one bomb that was tested in World War II. The bomb that was tested was not the uranium bomb. That's the next one. So the uranium bomb is the one that was not tested and it was just dropped, um, single bomb dropped in one place. The plutonium bomb was the other bomb and that one was the one that was tested at the Trinity site in New Mexico. But we're going to do the uranium bomb first. How did they make the uranium bomb? Well, the way that the uranium bomb works is as follows. You have a uranium nucleus like this. The uranium on its own will spontaneously decay into an alpha particle, so that's a helium nucleus, and whatever you get after uranium. I guess it would decay into thorium something or other, and then that thorium would decay into blah blah blah, and it would decay into something else, and then eventually you get to lead. So there's a decay chain with some beta particles and some other alpha particles that are emitted. Uh, if you start with uranium and eventually it works its way to lead. This is not how the uranium bomb works. It does not work by emitting alpha particles or emitting the radiation itself. The way that the uranium bomb works and the way that any nuclear weapon works is that you do fission. So when you have fission, you have the nucleus here, the uranium nucleus. You perturb the nucleus in some way typically in the form of absorbing a neutron. So a neutron comes along, gets absorbed by the nucleus. It makes the nucleus very unhappy. 
is a very sad nucleus like this. So you can see the tear dripping down. And the, when the sad nucleus is there, it will split into two daughter particles, two daughter nuclei, you know, like krypton and iodine or something like this. Uh, there's a, an ensemble. We'll take a look at what it breaks into in a little bit. And in the process of doing this, in the process of breaking apart, you get crumbs. So it's like taking a cookie, you break the cookie in half, you get two big halves and you get a bunch of crumbs. So those crumbs are additional neutrons that come out. Um, and it could be, it's typically two, it's between two and three neutrons that come out, depending upon how things break apart. It's a messy process. It's not like every time it, it decays in exactly the same way. So you'll get like three neutrons that come out. And these neutrons will travel through the material, that the uranium material, and be absorbed by other uranium atoms. So this one comes in, it makes this one sad. Now every, everything is sad. It's like a spreading virus comes and then this thing breaks apart and then you get new neutrons and stuff like that and as long as the number of neutrons that you produce is more than the number of neutrons that you need to be absorbed then you can get this chain reaction to sustain itself it will continue um, and it will grow exponentially so it runs away very quickly eventually what happens though is you run to the, you run out of material so you get to the edge so like here's your sad uranium out here and it's going to break and it's going to send neutrino or its neutrons like this and these two neutrons will escape the material, so they'll leave whatever the substance is. They're at the edge of the substance. And so they can't contribute anymore to this um, chain reaction. And so there's always an issue of when you make a bomb like this, you have to sustain the chain reaction, which means that all the particles that are going to uh, break apart, all the fission particles, um, all the particles that are going to go through fission, uh, need to be close together. And so that means that there is a density of these particles that you need to maintain. There is a critical density. Critical density. And there's a minimum size that you have for a given density. Uh, now this is not the... Typically you will hear people say that there's a critical mass. Uh, there's a critical mass of uranium in order to make a bomb. And some of the people who say there's a critical mass that you need to make a bomb are using it to discredit a type of energy production, clean energy production that they don't like because they don't understand it. So a critical mass implies there's a, a given density before you get to a critical mass. So like say the critical mass is, I don't know what it is, but let's pretend that the critical mass is 10 kilograms. It's 10 kilograms of uranium at some density. So if you have 100% percent uranium-235, uh, uranium 235 that's a 235 this is this is the material that we're going to use to make our bomb is uranium 235 if you have 100 percent uranium 235 and the critical mass is 10 kilograms what if you only have 50 percent uranium 235 so you've taken uranium you've enriched it which we haven't talked about but we'll get to it in a minute you've enriched it to only 50 percent uranium 235 well now the critical mass is not 10 kilograms it's going to be uh more like what um it's not I'd have to do the math myself, but it'll be something closer to 20 kilograms than 10 kilograms. And if the density of the material goes even lower, then um, if the density of your fissile material goes even lower, then the critical mass becomes even larger. And eventually you get to the point where the density of fissile material is so spread apart that you can't make a bomb out of it because the particles that you want to break apart, like this one, so here's one that wants to break apart well, they don't want to break apart because they become sad, but here's ones that could break apart and they're separated by too much material. And so if the density of your fuel is uh, too low, if the enrichment level is too low, then the there's no way to get them to interact with each other um, and produce the chain reaction. That's why when you walk outside, it isn't a blazing inferno of, you know, a nuclear chain reaction happening despite the fact that there's uranium and plutonium and well not plutonium but uranium and thorium in the soil so um so i don't know i i put 20 kilograms it might be different than that because when you add mass the volume increases um and things spread apart in in a way so there's there's details there that i didn't want to just come out and say what they were but let's pretend that's 20 kilograms um, there might be some, it probably depends also on the geometry. You know, if you make a rectangle, you get one thing. If you make a sphere, you get something else. Anyways, the critical mass is implies a, a density. So when the critical mass of uranium for one of these bombs was so many kilograms, that was at a given level of enrichment. 
So let's talk about the enrichment uh, momentarily. Let's say we have two uranium atoms like this, these two uranium atoms. This one is uranium-235, and this one is uranium-238. These are the most common uh, types of uranium atoms. Chemically, these two things are the same. They both have, uh, what, 92? They both have 92 electrons, and so they have the same chemistry. Um, there are small deviations, there are small differences in the chemistry, but they are very, very small uh, compared to the bulk properties of their chemistry. So the, they have essentially identical chemistry. In terms of their nuclear properties, they're very, very different from each other. The nucleus does not care that it's, um, it does not care as much that the fact that they're both uranium. They both have the same number of protons. Uh, the nuclear physics really cares primarily about the number of nucleons that are in the, in the nucleus. This one has 235 nucleons. This one has 238 nucleons, which means that there are three nucleons different from each other. That's like the difference between the chemical difference between lead and gold, which is all, which is three electrons, is the nuclear difference between uranium-235 and uranium-238. Three nucleons. It makes a big difference. And in general, the odd-numbered nuclei, these ones, are the ones that are easiest to break apart. The way that you break this apart is that you add a neutron to it. Uh, the neutron has to be captured. If the neutron's going too fast, they can't capture it. So you have to take a, a neutron that's fairly slow moving and you put it in here. And then uh, as it absorbs that neutron, it becomes unstable and breaks apart. So it momentarily becomes uranium-236 and then breaks apart. Um, but it starts as an odd numbered nucleus. So uranium-238 uh, starts as the even number nucleus. It is more stable. Uh, it doesn't uh, spontaneously break apart, and it actually has a relatively low probability of absorbing a neutron at a given speed. So let's take a look momentarily at um, the absorption, neutron absorption cross-section, neutron absorption cross-section for uranium isotopism. So if this works properly, yes, this is what I'm talking about. Here's what I'm talking about right here. So we will steal this person's image. Okay, so this is the probability of fission um, for these two different elements. So uranium-235 has this fission cross-section. It's a cross-section here in barns, uh, and that is a reference to hitting the broad side of a barn. So this is the absorption cross-section in barns, and this is the incident energy of the, of the neutron. So a neutron comes in and is gonna hit this nucleus. What's the probability of it being absorbed? So you'll notice that the high energy stuff, the stuff out here, has a low probability of being absorbed, right? It's one, it's one barn, one cross-section. On the other hand, if you have lower energy neutrons that come in, then the absorption cross-section is much higher. So look at the blue line, for example. The blue line starts here, it's at one barn at one capital MeV, so that's one million electron volts for the incident neutron energy, one barn. At one ten billionth of an MeV, so that's slow neutrons, that's like room temperature neutrons, it's almost it's five orders of magnitude, it's a hundred thousand times more likely to be absorbed. Okay, so let's say that you can't get quite this cold, so you're operating more around here, that's still 10,000 times more likely to be absorbed. So it's easier to absorb slow moving neutrons. There are these resonances here. So these are just related to the nuclear structure. So there are certain um, energies that will come in and are re easy to absorb because those correspond to the transition uh, energies of the nucleons within the nucleus. It would be like saying there are certain um, colors of light that are readily absorbed by an atom because that's where the atomic transitions are, the energy levels of the electrons. These correspond to the energy levels of the um, of the nucleons within the nucleus. And so there are some that are more easily absorbed, some energies of neutrons that are more easily absorbed than others. Okay, but either way, the most likely to be absorbed is this low energy stuff uh, down here for uranium-235. So. Uh, what does that mean? What were we talking about? We're talking about this uranium-235, that's what you're gonna break apart. It has the higher absorption cross-section by quite a bit, right? It's a factor of, this says it's a factor of 10. Um, it's, I think it's more than a factor of 10, right? This is, uh, looks like almost a factor of a thousand. 
um, more likely to be absorbed. So it's almost a factor of a thousand more likely to be absorbed when you uh, use uranium-235. And that's what allows you to have the explosion that you're looking for. Because a problem with a bomb is that once the chain reaction happens, the bomb starts to expand, which lowers the density of the material. So as the bomb is expanding, the density of the stuff goes down. And so you have to get a really high concentration to start with, or else the bomb, the chain reaction won't be able to sustain itself as it becomes less and less dense as it's spreading apart. Okay. There is... Uh, so there we go. It's uranium-235 is the element that we want to use because that is the stuff that is most easily absorbed. All right. The problem is that uranium-235 has a shorter half-life than uranium-238 does. Uranium-235 has a half-life of about 1 billion years. Uranium-238 has a half-life of around 5 billion years. And so over the course of the, since the creation of the solar system, so you have a nuclear explosion, creates all the heavy elements. Those heavy elements mix with the materials in the protoplanetary disk. The Earth is formed from those elements. And you start with probably equal abundances of uranium-235 and uranium-238. They probably all started at roughly the same abundance because the supernova explosion or the inspiraling neutron stars or whatever it was that created the heavy elements, it's probably not going to distinguish that much between uranium-235 and uranium-238. It's mass hysteria, dogs and cats living together, neutrons and protons flying around, bumping into things, getting absorbed by this, different things. The fact that one's got a few more neutrons in it, like 1% more neutrons in it, in this violent explosion is not that big of a deal. It doesn't... The explosion that created this stuff probably is going to produce them in roughly equal quantities. But then, once they're made, then they're going to slowly be decaying away into the lighter particles, into lead. And so the ones that have a shorter half-life are going to decay faster, and so the mixture that might have started at roughly 50-50 is going to start to shift towards the longer half-life. So today, uranium-235 corresponds to about, uh, I believe it's about half a percent. So let's take a look real quick, just to make sure. Um, isotopes of uranium. Shorter half-lives are preferable in explosions for a dirty bomb. Um, okay, let's see. I'm looking for isotopes of uranium right here. So we can see that there are... Um, so the half-life is 10 to the 8 years, 7 times 10 to the 8 years, which is like 10 to the 9 years, which is 1 billion. Uranium-238 has a half-life of 4.5 billion years, so it's much, much longer than this. There are other uranium isotopes that have relatively long half-life, uh, like uranium-233. Uh, now, this abundance here is the um, naturally occurring abundance, but you'll notice that uranium-233 has a half-life of 10 to the 5, so that's 100,000 years. That's a long time by the human by a human perspective, but it's not a long time by geological timescales where you're looking at billions of years that are 10,000 times longer than this. And so there's only trace amounts of uranium-233, there's only trace amounts of uranium-236 because they have short half-lives. Uranium-235 has a fairly long half-life and uranium-238 has an even longer half-life. So those are the things that dominate um, are uranium-235 and uranium-238. Uh, okay, so one of them is 99.7, the other one's 0.7. So it's about half a percent, which is what I said. Okay, good, because I like to say things that are correct. So you have a half a percent of uranium is this, and 99.5% uh, is uranium-238, roughly. Okay, so how do you enrich... If you want to have a bomb, you need to use uranium-235. And so how do you enrich it? You need to somehow separate out the uranium, the different types of uranium from each other. The problem is they both have the same chemistry. So in other processes, like if you're trying to separate uh, you know, copper and silver from each other, there are chemical means to do that because there are certain molecules that will form with certain chemical elements that don't form with others. So if you're uh, trying to separate chlorine and sodium from each other, then there's ways to do that. But uranium, these have the same chemical properties. So you can't separate these things chemically. You have to separate them physically. Uh, so physical um, separation is not the same process as chemical separation. Chemical separation you can do on a massive scale, industrial scale, and produce large quantities of things like that because you just, you dump in this chemical element, you do this thing, it precipitates out, you get some substance that comes in, you blow on it, you dump some water in, you stir it up a little bit, then something else precipitates out, you can separate things chemically. Separating them physically is a different animal. It's like refining oil. When you refine oil, uh, you have a large tower 
So here is this tower. You have a large tower. It's got different levels in it. Uh, each of these levels has a pipe that comes out. So here's your cylinder. You pump the oil in and you boil it. Oil has hydrocarbon chains uh, going from methane, which looks like this, um, to very long hydrocarbon chains, right? Here's another hydrocarbon chain that looks, there's carbon and hydrogen atoms. Um, and you have like hydrocarbon chains everywhere in between. So they all have different, you know, you have benzene that has like a, a ring like this. Um, so all these different hydrocarbon chains are in your crude oil. It's a mixture of all these things. And so you boil it and the heavy stuff will only, well, it evaporates at lower temperatures and it's heavier. And so it doesn't rise as high. So you have this distillation column where the light stuff comes up here. So gasoline comes up here. Methane, you'll, they will typically burn off the top. Although now I think they capture it more often than they don't. But you don't want, you'll flare methane. You don't want to release methane to the atmosphere. It's a pretty potent greenhouse gas. So it's better to burn it than it is to just release it to the, out into the open. It's better to capture it um, and do something with it than to do either of those. But anyways, so methane will be up at the top. Then you'll have gasoline and benzene. And then you have kerosene underneath that. It's a bit heavier. Octane will be in there. And then you've got other kinds of diesel fuel and things like that that have longer hydrocarbon chains. Then you'll have like waxes and oils and um, tar and things like that that will come out here. The longer hydrocarbon chains come out. So this is a physical separation. You're boiling them. You're boiling the substance and you're relying on the fact that they have different masses. Each of these molecules have a different masses and they will separate themselves in this distillation column and then you can siphon them off um, to make whatever products you need to make out of, the, out of that substance. So you have to do the same kind of thing with this uranium. You have uranium. It is a mixture of uranium-233 and uranium-235. I'm sorry, uranium-235 and uranium-238. Those have different masses and so you have to use the fact that they have different masses to separate them. So here's what you do you take your uranium you bind it with a whole bunch of fluorine it's hexafluoride it's uranium hexafluoride i believe uh, i could be wrong about this but i'm pretty sure it's uranium hexafluoride what that looks like this so you this is a gas uranium hexafluoride is a gas. uranium on its own is a solid and that's kind of hard to work with uranium hexafluoride is a gas and so you have uranium-235 hexafluoride and uranium-238 hexafluoride, which have slightly different masses. You then take this gas and you put it in a cylinder. Here is your cylinder. It looketh like this. You pump it into the cylinder and the cylinder is spinning around wicked fast, as they say. So it's spinning around wicked fast. And what's going to happen? Well, the heavy stuff is going to move, migrate towards the edges and the light stuff will concentrate in the center. The more massive stuff will move towards the edges. It's harder to accelerate, and so it has to accelerate at a larger separation. Um, and the lighter stuff will come to the middle. So this will be not primarily, but it will have a larger concentration of uranium-235. Uh, 235, I think it's supposed to be up here. I don't know where the chemical, where these numbers are supposed to go. And this will be mostly uranium-238 um, on towards the perimeter. Now, it's not entirely. It's the, the ratio changes from 0.5% to 0.6% uh, or 0.0 or 0.51%. But it's still improved in the abundance of uranium-235 coming from the center of the cylinder. So then you siphon out the stuff from the center of that cylinder and you put it in another cylinder. Here's another cylinder that's spinning wicked fast like this. The same thing happens, the uranium-238 gets on the sides, the uranium-235 is in the middle, you siphon that off, you run it over to another cylinder. Here's another cylinder, you do the same thing, and you do it over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. And eventually you will purify, or you will enrich your uranium um, in the ratio of 235 to 238. So now you have enriched uranium, and you have depleted uranium that's left over. So the stuff that comes from the edges is depleted in uranium-235 and is in, and therefore has more uranium-238 in it. And the stuff that comes from the center of these centrifuges is enriched in uranium-235. So there's enriched uranium and depleted uranium. So what does this look like? Uh, it looks like, what is it? This process looks like uranium centrifuge. It looks like this. So this is a pretty famous image for what these uranium centrifuges look like. So you have all these things lined up and you just siphon from one to the next to the next to the next to the next and you slowly, one step at a time, enrich the uranium. Now, if you want to enrich uranium to the point where you want to make nuclear energy, like commercial nuclear energy, 
then you will enrich your uranium from the 0.5%. Uh, so it starts as 0.5% uranium-235. And you will enrich it to about, it's less than 5%, but we'll say that you enrich it by a factor of 10 up to 5% uranium-235. It's typically more like 3% that you enrich it, but um, 5%. So this will be commercial reactor um, electricity producing nuclear fuel is 5% uranium-235. So you've enriched it a little bit. If you want to make a weapon, then you will enrich it to like 90% uranium-235. Okay, so this is for electricity, and this is for a bomb. Weapons grade plutonium is 80% or higher. I'm sorry, weapons grade uranium, I believe, is 80% enriched or higher. Um, so that's a big step. This is easy to do. This is hard to do. That's a factor of 100, more than 100, almost, almost a factor of 200 uh, enriched in uranium-235. So you have to go through that process a lot just to get a kilogram, um, right? Because this is a gas, and so it's all spread out. Just to get a kilogram of your nuclear fuel is uh, pretty amazing. Uh, it takes a lot of effort to do that, and it's expensive. It's expensive because you have to have this big industrial process that goes into it. It's expensive, but it's easy. So this is fairly straightforward to build. It's just expensive and it takes a lot of time to build it. Um, the other kind of bomb that we're going to talk about, and I need to get to it, is much harder to build. Um, it's easier to make. Uh, let's see, what's the right thing to say? It's easier to produce the fuel. It's harder to make the bomb. In this case, it's harder to produce the fuel and it's easier to make the bomb. Okay. Uh, is it possible to enrich to 100%? No, it's never possible to enrich all the way to 100%. Um, but it is... Um, you can get close to it. You only need to get up to the point where now you've enriched it this much, and now there's a critical mass at this much enrichment, there's a critical mass where you can make your bomb. So the way that you make a uranium bomb, once you've enriched it like this, is you take a slug of uranium-235, enriched uranium-235, and you have another slug of uranium-235 over here, and you separate them from each other. So it's each individual component is smaller than the critical mass which means that the amount of uranium-235 that's in here and the relative proximity of the uranium-235 in this thing are too, um, they're too spread apart and there are too many edges for this to sustain a chain reaction and therefore to explode. And then the same thing is true over here. So it's too spread apart. But once you bring them together, then, um, then you have reached the critical mass you have enough uranium-235 in order to get the explosion to happen. You don't have much time to do it, but that's what you have. They also packed the interior with uranium-238 because as we saw here, even though, actually I mean here, even though uranium-238 um, has a lower absorption cross-section, if you fill, if you use enough, uh, you release enough neutrons, you can get the uranium-238 to also explode to also go through the fission process. And in particular, you'll notice that it's the high energy stuff over here. It's almost equal at high energies to what you have at low energies. And so uranium-238 can absorb high energy neutrons and break apart. And so when they made this bomb, they also packed around a bunch of uranium-238 kind of in this chamber. So here's the uranium-238, just so that they could get a little bit more um, explosion out of what they had. Because the bomb, as soon as it starts the chain reaction, it's tearing itself apart and everything is spreading apart. Um, only a fraction of the fuel or only a fraction of the material actually exploded because the chain reaction wasn't able to propagate all the way through the material. So that they had to do these calculations beforehand to figure out you know, how that worked. Anyways, here is uh, the stuff. Here are these things, they're gonna, they're gonna bring them together. Um, I should point out right now that I noted that the fission for uranium-235 Notice that up here that the fission for uranium-235 is better, um, that will absorb things at these high energies. When the bomb goes off, when the neutrons first come out, these are the energies of the particles that come off. To take advantage of this uh, large cross-section, um, you don't get this in a bomb. It's impossible to have a bomb that absorbs these kinds of elements because you, can't, you have to cool them down. You have to reduce the neutron energy from a million electron volts down to one what, like one milli from one mega electron volt down to one milli electron volt. And so that you can't do on the time scale of an explosion of a bomb. This you can do in a commercial nuclear reactor. So nuclear reactors, which we'll talk about later, 
use thermal neutrons, these cold neutrons down here. The bomb itself uses fast neutrons up here. And notice that the absorption cross-section of uranium-235 is better than the absorption cross-section of uranium-238 by a factor of 10. This is definitely a factor of 10. This should be, there should be a three up here, 10 to the three. Anyway, so that's, that's why you use uranium-235. It's got a better absorption cross-section, but that doesn't mean the uranium-238 does not have an absorption cross-section. And if it's cheap to get, and you already have a bunch lying around, then you just pack your bomb with that kind of stuff. Anyway, so that's what's going on here. Then what you do is you put a regular explosive on either side of this thing. So you have it in a cylinder. You put an explosive on either side of these two parts. And then when you get to the desired altitude, you blow up these two things, or one of the two. I don't remember if it had one thing or two. Um, I suspect it only had one. So you blow up this thing and it fires this projectile in here and brings it into this position where the chain reaction, now you've reached the critical mass uh, and the chain reaction can go and then this thing, now it blows up and that gives you the bomb. So the uranium bomb, this type of bomb, needs to be kind of long and skinny in order to have this geometry inside of it. And that is what we, observe, what we see here with little boy. Little boy is long and skinny because you have these two uranium uh, pieces and then you're gonna bring them together and get the bomb to go off. All right, in the interest of time, so that's how you make a uranium bomb. In the interest of time, I need to move on to a plutonium bomb or we're not gonna get through everything in one day. Um, okay, the plutonium bomb uses a different substance. It uses plutonium-239. Poo-239. So uranium or plutonium-239, notice that it has an odd number and therefore it has uh, it will produce fissions more readily than the even numbered elements. This is not something that occurs in nature. It has a shorter half-life. If we look at the half-life of uh, plutonium, isotopes of plutonium, a uh, half-life of plutonium is 24,000 years. That's not very long. So any plutonium that was made um, in the, at the creation of the solar system is basically gone. So plutonium doesn't work very well. Let's take a look at the absorption cross-section. Absorption cross-section of plutonium, plutonium-239. We'll go to an images. It should be a similar looking graph. Okay, here is a similar looking graph. We'll use this one. Okay, so this is showing plutonium-239, 240, 241. Notice that plutonium-239 is up here, as is plutonium-241, both odd numbers. They have an absorption cross-section up here that's uh, pretty high, and they have an absorption cross-section down here that is um, similar to what you would get with uranium. And then plutonium-240, the even-numbered one, has a lower absorption cross-section for this low-energy stuff. Okay, so plutonium-239, Plutonium isn't naturally occurring, so you have to manufacture plutonium-239. The way that you manufacture plutonium-239 is as follows. You take uranium-238, take uranium-238, and you add a neutron to it. The neutron comes in, and it's not a fission absorption, so you don't absorb it in order to break the uranium-238 into pieces. Instead, you absorb this so that it comes in and converts it from plutonium or from uranium-238 to uranium-239. So you produce uranium-239, and then this will beta decay into plutonium-238. I'm sorry, 239. So it will, you add a neutron to it, so it becomes uranium-239, and then it goes through a beta decay process where the, a neutron turns into a proton, and now you've raised it by one proton and removed one neutron, so you have the same total number of nucleons, but now it's plutonium instead of uranium. Um, you have to go through two steps to do this. I think you have to go through two steps to do this because I believe that there is neptunium in the way. So if I go to p-table, I have to go from uh, plutonium or uranium here through neptunium to plutonium. So I start with uranium-238, I add a neutron to it, it's going to produce um, uranium-239, that will spontaneously decay into neptunium-239, which again will decay into plutonium-239. So you go through that kind of process uh, to get from uranium to, to plutonium. But you start with um, uranium-238 and eventually you get plutonium-239. You have to breed it. So you go through a breeder 
type process to take uranium-238 and produce the, the plutonium-239. Uh, how quick is the decay chain? Uh, that I don't know. It's pretty fast for plutonium. So to make a plutonium breeder reactor, for example, I think it's just days. The, the neptunium half-life is only a few days. Where um, when we talk about nuclear energy on a later stream, we'll see that the thorium-233 half-life, and it's actually, it's protactinium. Is it protactinium? Yeah, so from thorium, you have to produce protactinium before you produce uranium. When you do a thorium breeder reactor, the protactinium has a half-life of like 50 days. And so that's something that you have to deal with that you don't have to deal with when you're dealing with uranium to plutonium. Because it's just a, the vicissitudes of life made it so that neptunium has a, has a shorter half-life than protactinium does. And so this process is fairly straightforward. It doesn't take a particularly long amount of time. Um, you know, just maybe even hours. I guess we could look it up. Uh, Half-life, uh, whoops, not what I meant to do. Let's go like this. Half-life of neptunium-239. Two days. So anyways, it stays at the intermediate stage for two days, and then you have your plutonium at the end. Okay, now you have a bunch of plutonium, and it's a good bomb-making material. The problem is, so it doesn't last as long. It's only 20,000 years, but 20,000 years is still a long time by human standards, but it's not a long time by geological standards. So you have to produce the plutonium. You can't just go out and find it in the ground. Okay, the way that you make a plutonium bomb is now you have a shell. You make a spherical shell of plutonium enriched material. So this is like some kind of plutonium ceramic or plutonium metal alloy or something like that. Okay, and you need to concentrate all of this stuff in the center of the shell. So you have to produce this critical mass um, you enrich it to a large extent so that you get good absorption. And you want to concentrate all this stuff in the center of the bomb. You can't just make a, you can't do the same thing that you did with the um, uranium because I, I think it's that it's more highly reactive. And so you have to get it m even further spread apart. You wouldn't be able to make the, the two blocks of material that you bring together. Um, you have to get it even more spread apart so that you don't get the spontaneous chain reaction. So you put it in a spherical shell like this, and then you put regular dynamite type charges in a spherical shell around that. And then you have to get all of these components. So now you wire it up. So here's all these wires coming off of this. All the wires, they're all collected over here towards some detonator. So here's your detonator that's gonna send an electrical signal along all these wires and blow up all of this um, surrounding material, all the regular type explosives that are around your plutonium. So all of the lengths of these cabling, every length of cable has to be exactly right. Because if part of the bomb, if this part of the bomb or, or this part of the charges explodes first, then it's going to start collapsing this part of the bomb. This will go through the chain reaction and explode and destroy the rest of the bomb. And it will, the bomb will destroy itself before it's able to actually work effectively. The bomb will blow itself up, which is a lot easier to do than blowing up a city. So it, the timing of the arrival of the signal to blow up all the explosives was crucial. And the speed with which the explosives themselves blow up is also important. If you do this with like black powder that burns very slowly, then you're going to get an uneven collapse of that spherical shell. So the idea is you have this spherical shell of plutonium like this. Here's the spherical shell of plutonium. And you want to get it to all come in at exactly the same time at a high rate of speed. And so if there's any asymmetry where like this part is moving fast and this part here is moving more slowly, then it's not going to concentrate. Like this stuff will concentrate, the bomb will blow up um, before this has a chance to join in the party. And so you have to have explosives that burn fast enough, like black powder, it's too uneven. It burns too slowly to do this. You have to have a fast explosive that goes around here and they all have to fire at exactly the same time. And the engineering tolerances to get this thing to work are much, much higher. So it takes a lot more engineering to make a bomb like this than it does to make a uranium bomb. Uranium bomb, you just take these two slugs, you smush them together, it blows up. For a plutonium bomb, you have to build this highly technical device that has cutting edge, all sorts of things in order to get it to work. This is what they tested at the Trinity site in New Mexico, was this type of bomb, is a plutonium bomb. And you'll notice that the shape of the bomb that you make, because it has this spherical shell of plutonium, is nice and round. So little boy looked like this. Come on, you can do it. There, little boy looked like this, long and skinny. 
where Fat Man, which was the name of the other bomb, looked different. So where's Fat Man? Fat, Fat Man. This is Fat Man. Okay, so this was the second bomb that was dropped. And notice that it is more spherical in shape because that is the structure that you make your plutonium bomb. So, uh, so there we go, that's a plutonium bomb. You produce the plutonium by starting with uranium, then you make your uh, fissile material. Uh, you have to have it high enough enrichment so that, uh, for the case of plutonium, um, when you make the plutonium, so here's uh, something that we already talked about when it came to the uranium. When you make the plutonium, plutonium chemically, oops, plutonium is PU, plutonium chemically is not the same thing as uranium chemically. These are two different chemical elements. So this one might bind, uranium will bind to six fluorides and plutonium will bind to what, five fluorides or maybe seven fluorides. It will bond, bind to a different number of fluorides. And so you can chemically separate, you can use chemistry to separate because it has a different electron structure. Chemically separate uranium fl from plutonium, much easier. So this one has a much different mass than uranium does um, because it binds to a whole new fluorine atom and therefore it will have a different precipitation rate. Uh, you know, you get to some molality and anyways, you make a fluid or a gas out of this stuff and they're much different in mass. And so you can chemically separate them. Like the chemical properties are different. That's very different than uranium-235 and uranium-238, which have the same chemical properties. And so you have to rely on the um, this industrial manufacturing process in order to enrich your uranium. So once you make the plutonium, it's easier to pull it out of your system and to make your alloys, like your bomb out of it. Uh, with uranium, it's a much uh, longer process. This is cheaper to do. Um, and the bomb is cheaper to make. I'm sorry, let me say that again. This is more expensive to do, but the bomb is easier to make and doesn't require as much engineering. This is um, more expensive, has a higher technolo technology threshold. So if you're North Korea, you're gonna make this kind of bomb. If you're you know, some third world country or like developing country that doesn't have a nuclear bomb program but wants to have one, it's gonna be through the uranium um, way that you're gonna do it. That's why there was all the hubbub about um, the certain kind of aluminum that was being shipped into Iran and into Iraq, because that's the kinds of, it's aluminum designed to make centrifuges, um, because that's the easier threshold to meet. This is, it's a more expensive process, but it takes a lower threshold of technological advancement. Plutonium bombs take, you know, it's the engineers from the largest industrial country in the world, um, thousands of engineers to make two bombs of this kind and billions of dollars to make two bombs of the plutonium variety. Okay, uh, they're both basically the same kind of power. Like they'll both explode with um, roughly the same amount. That's just a matter of how massive is your um, bomb making material, like your weapons material. So how many days can these be stored? These have half-lives of like tens of thousands of years for, from plutonium versus billions of years for the uranium or almost a billion years for the uranium. And so they can be stored forever. Um, you just don't want to store them. There was a mistake, or uh, uh, fortunately, it wasn't a, as bad of a mistake as it could have been. But there was a place, I think it was in Oak Ridge National Laboratory, where they piled up a bunch of uranium on one side of a wall and a bunch of uranium, enriched uranium, on the other side of the wall. And so there's like six inches, or whatever the wall thickness was, between a pile of enriched uranium here and a pile of enriched uranium over here. And, oh, that's uh, that... Anyway, so here's this wall. <clears throat> that could have been embarrassing. Um, so it had these two things that were piled up on either side of the wall. And the problem with this is that the neutrons don't care. The neutrons don't care about the wall. They're just gonna go through the wall and cause a big explosion to happen here. Where um, with, you know, chemically they're not gonna interact with each other, but with nuclear physics, they, they could have had a big explosion. Um, take place. Anyways, fortunately, it, they were far enough apart and it wasn't enriched enough that the bomb took off. But I, there were some physicists that came in. I don't know. I don't remember all the details of the story, but someone came in and was like, whoa, that needs to move right now. And they're like, okay, I'll move all this stuff. And they piled it up on the other side, of, you know, in a different place. Okay. So that is a uranium uh, and a plutonium bomb. The third type of bomb to, that came out after the fact uh, is a hydrogen bomb. And I don't know all the details about making a hydrogen bomb. What I will say is that a hydrogen bomb uses fusion, 
where a uranium and plutonium bomb, these use fission. So fission is when you take a heavy nucleus, heavy nucleus like this, and you split it into lighter uh, daughter, daughter particles. Fusion is where you take light particles, like low mass particles, and you squish them together and make heavy stuff. But you'll say, why? Why is it that I can take things and mush them together and get heavy stuff and release energy? So this releases a bunch of energy. Or I can take heavy stuff and break it apart and release energy. So this releases a whole bunch of energy. How is it that I can take light stuff and make heavy stuff and release energy? Or I can take heavy stuff and release light stuff and get energy. Doesn't this mean I can make a perpetual motion machine? I could be rich. I could make heavy stuff and then make light stuff and then make heavy stuff and make light stuff and emit energy the whole time. Wow. Well, it doesn't work that way. The reason it doesn't work that way is because you only get energy out of fusion as far as the nuclei get increasingly tightly bound, more and more tightly bound as you go to heavier and heavier elements. And you can only extract energy from fission because when you do this, the nucleus, these daughter particles are more tightly bound than the parent particle. So the eventually you get to the point where there is a most tightly bound nucleus. So the most tightly bound nucleus, there are actually two that are basically the same. It depends on how you, how you measure tightly boundedness. Um, it's nickel, nickel 60, I think, and it's uh, iron 56. Iron 56 and nickel 60, I think these are the two. Uh, this one I'm sure about, iron 56. Nickel 60, I think, is correct. Anyways, these are the most tightly bound nuclei. That means that the nuclear force is the strongest in these things, and you haven't yet added all these extra protons in there that starts to pull the nucleus apart. So all the nucleons in these nuclei are close enough together that the strong nuclear force dominates, and the electrostatic force from the fact that the, the nucleus is so big and floppy. So you have this gigantic floppy nucleus. You'll have stuff on one side and stuff on the other that repel each other through the electrostatic force um, because they're too far apart to interact via the nuclear forces. And so this will actually mean that you have to add more neutrons to it in order to get it to remain stable. So anyways, these are the two most tightly bound. So you can do, you can extract energy through fusion up to until you produce iron. And you can extract energy from fission until the daughter particles are iron. Uh, there is a graph of this that is the uh, nuclear binding energy plot. And it looks like this, this one right here. So we'll open that in a new tab. Here's our amazing nuclear binding energy plot. So the more tightly bound you get, this is the most tightly bound energy is up here or up here at iron. So when you fuse hydrogen into helium and lithium and beryllium and stuff like that, you release this energy per nucleon. You release this much energy. It's a lot of energy that gets released. And then once you get to iron, the nucleus is as tightly bound as you can get. So in order, excuse me, in order to make an element that is heavier than iron, you actually have to add energy to the nucleus. And it's that energy that ultimately gets released when you go from uranium-235 and break it apart. Oh, so one of the things that I, uh, I guess I'll talk about it when I talk about nuclear energy, but the daughter particles that come out of this, they typically come out in, with slightly different masses. Um, that'll be important for the nuclear energy discussion that will take place in a couple days or in a couple weeks. Okay, so uh, you cannot do fusion and then fission and then fusion and then fission and always get energy out of it. Because when you cross iron, you actually have to add that energy back into the system in order to get this. So you let the neutron star mergers or the supernova from giant stars produce the uranium-235 and then you can extract this much energy per nucleon um, to release it to make your bomb or your power plant or you can start with hydrogen and fuse it into helium and lithium and so forth and release this energy. So that's how it does. Uh, there's a question, isn't making iron already, doesn't it already take iron to, um, doesn't already take iron to make, doesn't it always already take energy to make the iron? Uh, I don't think so. I think that you absorb it until you get up to that point. Um, it depends on like where you're coming from because the different isotopes of iron have different binding energies, and so it depends on where you're landing in the landscape of possible isotopes that you're producing. Um, are there stars that burn iron? No. Once you once you have a star where it's produced an iron core, then it's going to blow up 
because every time you add iron to it, or when you try to fuse iron into something heavier, it removes energy from the system, um, and so it causes everything to collapse on itself. It's uh, pretty gnarly. Okay, so when it comes to a fusion bomb, a hydrogen bomb, you have a bunch of hydrogen contained in some vessel, some container, like this. It would like, uh, it likes to stay apart from each other. It doesn't like to blow up. Uh, you have to overcome the electrostatic repulsion of all these protons, which means you have one of two options. You can either raise the temperature very, very high, okay? Because what, hap what happens in this case, and I've shown this plot before, is you have a well that looks like this. So you have one proton down here, and you have another proton over here that's coming in with some amount of energy. In order to get this thing to fuse and to release its energy, this proton has to come down has to make it over this hill and come down here and bind with this proton, and then it releases its energy. It releases this much energy. However much it comes in with, minus however much it's left with at the end, minus mc squared, however much the mass changes. The reason the mass changes for these protons as they come in, as we've talked about already, is because the binding of the quarks. The energy that goes into binding the quarks together is what produces the most of the mass of the quarks that go into the protons. And so you rearrange the quark bonds uh, and the gluon field, and you change the mass. It releases that, um, releases that mass, or it releases that energy. Okay. Anyways, uh, you have this potential barrier that comes from the fact that these charges are they're like charges. So you have to overcome the electrostatic repulsion. When the proton comes in, either you have to get it come have it come in with super high energy so that it will bind itself. You know, it's got this much energy to start with. That's hard to do. Or what you can do is send it in with a lower amount of energy and try a whole bunch of times and hope that it will quantum tunnel through this barrier and appear on the other side. The sun does this process. The sun's temperature, the core temperature, it's high. It's what, 15 million, is it? It's 4 million Kelvin, I think. 15 million for the, or 27 million Kelvin. Oh, that's Fahrenheit, so cut it in half and yeah. So 15 million Kelvin is the temperature in the core of the sun. That is not sufficient to produce fusion on its own. Um, it relies on the fact that the density at the core of the sun is very high, and so you get a lot of tries. And quantum tunneling is how the sun shines. We don't have that prob We don't have that luxury on the Earth because we can't reach the densities that you have at the core of the sun, and so we have to go to very high temperatures. So the temperature in a fusion reactor, when we make one, or we do have some that operate, but they uh, they're not profitable. Um, but the temperatures in a nuclear fusion reactor are higher than the temperatures in the core of the sun because we don't have the luxury of trying to a bunch of times. We have to get it in on one shot. And so um, how do you get these high energies? How do you raise the temperature of these protons to very high values? Well, the answer is that you have your hydrogen here. So here's your hydrogen bottle, and you're going to fuse that hydrogen into helium. It's usually made out of deuterium because deuterium fuses at a lower temperature than pure hydrogen, like a single proton. So deuterium has a proton and a neutron in it. It fuses at a lower temperature. Deuterium, you can fuse deuterium, I'm sorry, blah, blah, blah. you can fuse deuterium in the core of a brown dwarf, which is like 13 solar masses. Uh, I'm sorry, 13 Jupiter masses, uh, where it takes 100 Jupiters to make something, it takes, I'm sorry, it takes 1,000 Jupiters to make the sun. So the uh, deuterium fusion is a lot easier to do. So this is heavy water. So uh, you typically have to find heavy water uh, and you'll have a stockpile of heavy water if you're gonna have a fusion, a hydrogen bomb weapons production. The heavy water, deuterium is not uncommon. It's one part in 10 to the five. So for every hydrogen atom that you have in a drop of water, uh, one in 10 to the five of them is deuterium. This is set by the physics of the early universe. So the early universe uh, was hot and dense. It produced a bunch of light elements, including deuterium. And this is the ratio that you get from the first 15 minutes of the lifetime of the, it's actually like the first, well, yeah, a thousand seconds, 15 minutes. So the first 15 minutes of the universe's lifetime produced all the deuterium that we have on the earth. And it's about a part, what, 10 parts per million is the ratio of deuterium to regular hydrogen. And so you can distill this uh, through some physical separation process, right? Water behaves like water, and then you just do the same kind of centrifuge type thing, for example, as a way to extract the heavy water. So you have heavy water, and now that means you have a high concentration of deuterium, and then you can take that deuterium and put it into 
some kind of vessel like this. Then you surround that vessel with uh, probably plutonium. So you have a plutonium bomb. So here's your plutonium bomb like this. And here's your conventional bomb outside of that. So now if you want to get a fusion, a thermonuclear bomb uh, or a hydrogen bomb, you take a conventional bomb, you use that conventional bomb to blow up a plutonium bomb like Fat Man. The plutonium bomb will come in and it will explode and raise the temperature high enough to get the deuterium to start fusing. And then this thing blows up and you get an enormous release of energy per nucleon for deuterium. Right? I showed that uh, here on this one. Going from hydrogen to, or going from deuterium, so it would be two, to uh, whatever this is, helium, which is up here, that's a huge step in energy. You get a huge amount of energy released per nucleon um, compared to what you get for uranium. So it's what, like a factor of five, something like that. So in order to make a hydrogen bomb, you have to have both, um, you basically have to have a plutonium bomb, a regular conventional nuclear weapon in order to get the temperatures high enough to make the hydrogen bomb go off. There we go. That is nuclear weapons in all of its power and glory. Um, there might be other designs for uh, hydrogen bombs that, to me, they're not as interesting because it's the uranium bombs that have more historical significance and it's the uranium that, um, those, some of those processes that you go through to make nuclear energy. And nuclear energy is, it's a different animal, right? You're operating, with nuclear energy, you're operating at lower concentrations where you, you can't, it's not, it's physically not possible to make a bomb out of nuclear fuel. Um, you have to enrich it to weapons grade, which is, you, you wouldn't do that for a nuclear plant. Okay, does anybody have any questions about this stuff? Uh, there were some questions that I missed, so I will go back and see what we've got. So haven't they recently used lasers to reach high density? Uh, they don't use the lasers to reach high density. They, uh, yeah, okay. So they use the lasers to reach high pressure, um, which is raising to get high temperatures. Uh, the way that that works, so I, I, I misspoke, I'm sorry. They use the laser to get the high temperatures. It's not in order to get the high densities. Uh, they need the density high enough so that you get the collisions to happen. And so that you'll have a concentration of, um, and we'll talk about lasers when we do the, when we do nuclear energy. Um, you have a capsule that's filled with your deuterium and then you fire a laser in all directions and you have to confine the hydrogen into this small volume or else it will just escape. Um, you have to confine it in there long enough for the temperature to rise up high enough to get the fusion to take place. So you confine it, it's inertial confinement. You confine the hydrogen into these little pellets. They're really tiny pellets. They're like, um, like grains of sand size pellets. And then you hit those with a laser beam. Uh, the pellets prevent the hydrogen from getting, escaping the region as they heat up until the point where they uh, get high enough to actually fuse and, and then you get the first of energy that comes off of that. So what killed people was the water and not the uranium. Okay, so when it comes to the... Uh, now, with the thermonuclear bomb, like with the hydrogen bomb, that is... Uh, so heavy water, there's nothing wrong with heavy water. You can drink heavy water. It would be a very expensive beverage, but you can drink it. Um, and so it's not the heavy water that killed people, that kills anybody. It's the explosion that kills people, the release of energy. Uh, what kind of fusion reactor do you think will do the trick versus for a new energy source? Well, I think that ITER seems to be the most promising, although I don't know, um, but that's a tokamak. Uh, is there radioactive fallout? There is radioactive fallout from uh, one of these hydrogen bombs because you have a conventional nuclear, well, conventional nuclear, uh, you have another nuclear bomb that's there. So it will release um, all of that all of the products from the fission of the plutonium that went into making the the initial the the fission bomb that produced the fusion bomb in the center so you do get the same kind of stuff hey thank you for that rate i appreciate that uh what are the different kinds of nuclear bombs so we did four kinds of nuclear bombs that we talked about dirty bombs which we decided you couldn't actually well you could make one but you'd be dead um, by the time you made it then we talked about a uranium bomb we talked about a plutonium bomb, so those were the two that were used in World War II, and then we talked about a hydrogen bomb. There, and there's a, a variety of different kinds of hydrogen bombs that were made that were made back in the day. 
Um, but in general, to make a hydrogen bomb, you have to have a regular plutonium or uranium bomb that raises the temperature high enough to get the fusion to take place. Okay, let's see. Uh, what I find super fascinating is the fact that a man was able to actually think of creating a device to obliterate potentially millions of people from a bomb. Well, that was the concern. So the concern uh, at the beginning of World War II, is actually before World War II, was that Germany had discovered, so it was Otto Hahn and Lise Mittner, I think it was Lise Mittner, uh, discovered uh, f fusion. I'm sorry, fission. They discovered fission. They discovered that something was producing barium isotope um, and they're like, the only way to do this is if you actually break it apart. And so uh, Mittner, I, let me confirm that it was Lise Mittner because it will, it was kind of important to the story. Lise Mittner, Lise Mittner, M-E-I-T-N-E-R. Leading, yeah, okay. So Lise Mittner was working with Otto Hahn in Germany um, and she, was her parents were Jewish. She actually was Lutheran, but her parents were Jewish. And that was all that it took in Nazi Germany in the 1930s to get on the wrong side of the political establishment. And so Otto Hahn uh, basically smuggled her out um, to, so let's look at the map. I could be wrong about this. I believe she was in Berlin. Um, okay, so that's not what I meant to say. I didn't mean to type Gottingen, but I did anyways. Uh, I believe she was in Berlin. I could be wrong about this. Um, it's a history thing that you look up and then you forget. Um, anyway, so she, she was here working with Otto Hahn. Let's pretend she was in Berlin. She's in here working with Otto Hahn. Uh, I think someone, and it may have been Otto Hahn, gave her the wedding, a wedding ring, like his wedding ring, in order to... And it could have been Otto Hahn or it could have been someone in the same laboratory. But they knew that they had to smuggle her out because this is when the Nazis basically said, OK, we're no longer rec recognizing the passports of any Jews. And her passport was Austrian. She was from Austria. Um, they didn't. They're like, we're no longer going to recognize the passports of anyone. And so the Jews have to stay in the country. And they're like, OK, time for you to leave. And so they gave her someone's wedding ring to act to use as a bribe if she needed to bribe the guards at the border. And they sent her on a train to Groningen. I think that's how, to, I don't know how to pronounce this. Groningen right here, there's a university here in the Netherlands. And this was kind of the hub for or one of the hubs where people would funnel through Groningen. And then was it Max Planck? No, it wasn't Max Planck. Uh, who was it? Um, Bohr, I think it was Niels Bohr who was working here. And uh, hopefully I'm getting the story right. Uh, and then he would send them from Groningen to different locations around the area. So either to the UK or to Denmark. And he ended up sending Lise Mittner up to Stockholm. So her son, I believe, was in Copenhagen. And she went from there up to Stockholm. And so she was smuggled out basically at the same time that she discovered nuclear fission with Otto Hahn. So uh, I think she won the Nobel Prize for it. Anyways. Uh, so here she is in Stockholm. This was discovered. It was shared fairly quickly, spread around the scientific world that there was this new thing that was discovered and it released a lot of energy. It was, I mean, it's fairly straightforward calculation to see how much energy can be released at a given time. And then there was someone in the United States who was like, this is a big deal. We need to tell President, Eisen or President um, Roosevelt that there's a new form of energy that's been discovered that there's a potential for Germany to create a weapon um, that would be more destructive than any weapon ever made. And we better get the Americans working on building this weapon on our own, because if the Germans have it and we don't, then the war's over. Like, well, and there wasn't a war at this time, but Germany is acting very belligerently. They've already taken over the Sudetenland. They've already um, done the Anschluss, where they added Austria to the, to the Reich. And so they're like, Germany's being really aggressive, and there's this new thing that was discovered in a German um, laboratory. So we need to make sure that we don't fall behind in an arms race. And that person wasn't, um, that person didn't feel that they were influential enough with the president, and so contacted Eisen, uh, Einstein, I keep saying Eisenhower, contacted Einstein and said, Einstein, this is important. You need to write a letter because the president will listen to what you say, because you, you're celebrity enough that um, he will take your advice. And so Einstein wrote a letter to FDR 
Einstein letter to FDR. I think it was one. It may have been. It may have been more than one. A, a series of letters. Maybe there were four letters that were written to FDR. Maybe it's just one. Anyway, so he wrote a letter to uh, this guy right here, Slizar. I don't know how to pronounce that. Anyways, he didn't think he was important enough to be listened to, and he's probably right. He probably wouldn't have been listened to. But Einstein wrote this letter, and this is what it looks like. It's basically like here's this new thing that was discovered. Um, in view of the situation, you may think it desirable to have a permanent contact maintained between the administration and a group of physicists working on chain reactions in America. In particular, uh, the group in, it fairly quickly started up with the Chicago pile um, with uh, in making a sustained nuclear reaction. Uh, so the first sustained nuclear reaction took place at the University of Chicago with the Chicago pile. We'll talk about that when we talk about nuclear energy. Um, to speed the experimental work, which at the present is being carried out within the limits of the budgets of the university laboratories by provisioning funds such as funds required through these things. I understand that Germany has actually stopped the sale of uranium from Czechoslovakia. So that was a big indicator as well. As soon as Germany's like, okay, we're not selling this anymore, then they're using it for something. Um, from the Czechoslovakian mines, which she has taken over. That she should have taken such early action might perhaps be understood on the ground that the son of the German Undersecretary of State, von Husenberger, uh, is attached to the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute in Berlin, where some of the American work on uranium is now being repeated. So it was this Kaiser Wilhelm Institute in Berlin where there's some work going on. Anyway, so Einstein is saying, you need to do this. And this is what spawned the Manhattan Project and got it going. Thank you for that sub, I appreciate it. Uh, question, does that produce heat or just light? It produces both. Um, and it, yeah, it produces both. It, it's just a release of energy and then you get all these interactions between the photons that come out and the uh, neutrons that come out and start bumping into things in the atmosphere and it heats up the atmosphere and uh, spreads a bunch of nuclear, deep, like the daughter particles. Uh, so when the explosion, when the fission happens, you get a bunch of daughter particles. Those daughter particles will have half-lives of differing things. And so not only do you get the big explosion of light first that kills, I mean, it's a huge amount of light. And so that was a first wave of things. And then you have people getting radiation sickness from the fallout, from the byproducts. So it was kind of both of those things. Um, yes, the Russians did test the most powerful bomb ever. It was called the Tsar Bomba. Um, if I go back to the maps, the Tsar Bomb was flown from an airbase over here somewhere in near the Kola Peninsula. I think it's in the Kola Peninsula. There's an airbase over here. And it was flown over this island, this long skinny island, and dropped somewhere around here. And there was basically like they expected a 50% chance that the pilots would die. They wouldn't be able to get away fast enough. And so anyways, that was the SAR bomb. And it was in 1960, something like that, where it was dropped. Anyways, that was there. In the United States, there was a lot of nuclear testing that took place in the 50s. Uh, let me see if I can zoom in on this uh, because it's my backyard. So the nuclear test site in the United States is doesn't officially exist or didn't officially exist until a little while ago, but it's here. It's not Area 51. It's part of the nuclear test site. Um, so, uh, okay, here's Mesquite. Here is, let me go back to the just a regular thing so I can find where I'm looking at. Um, okay, so Mercury. Mercury is a town that is basically run by the Department of Energy. It's a company town. Indian Springs, there's an Air Force Base right here, Creech Air Force Base. Um, as you go outside of Las Vegas up here to this area, this gives you entrance into the nuclear test site. The nuclear test site is basically all of this. There's, there's no civilian activity really that takes place in this area. So as you come in uh, and let's go just north of this, there is a valley. So you can see all these buildings and they do different things on these different sites. So Area 51 is a portion of the nuclear test site, uh, but there's other things that they tested here, like the SR-71 was um, developed in Nevada in this area. Okay, this is where the nuclear explosive experimental facility. So here's where you go. These are the buildings where you're going to blow up a bunch of bombs. And this is what it looks like after you blow up a bunch of bombs of differing sizes. So here's some small bombs over here and then you have some bigger bombs that went off over here 
and you have some other bombs that went off up here. See, these are all different. So that's the nuclear test site in the Las Vegas area. Here's the, a really, really big bomb that went off right here. So that, uh, there you go. That is the nuclear test. You can see down on this side, here's some other bombs that went off. So there we go. Uh, these craters are still here, right? This is, a, they haven't moved at all. Um, it, craters take a long time to erode away, especially when there's no weather nearby. You can go to sites in uh, France, for example. You go to Verdun, outside of Verdun in France, and the ground is still pockmarked from uh, exploding, the explosions, the bombardments that took place at the siege of Verdun in 1917. So it's more than 100 years ago, and the ground is still uneven and pockmarked and stuff like that. So is it radioactive now? Um, I don't know which of these were, I mean, some of them were above ground. So if you look at um, nuclear test from Las Vegas, right, there's images from downtown Las Vegas looking at the nuclear explosions going off at the test site. So some of them were above ground, some of them were below ground. Um, but there you go. Uh, there's probably radioactive. Yeah, it's a place where you don't want to walk around. I suspect that there's quite a bit of fallout in the soil there. So that's why they did it there and not in Pennsylvania or something like that. You know, because nobody cares about Nevada. Uh, what is a neutron bomb? So a neutron bomb, you would produce a. I don't know a whole lot of details about that, but you the burst of particles that come out of it is a neutron and you basically flood the human body with a bunch of neutrons which go in and can destroy dna and things like that so my understanding of a neutron bomb is that you don't really it's not the release of energy that's the big deal it's the release of the neutrons that's a big deal and the advantage well, to the to the extent that it's an advantage the advantage of a neutron bomb is that it destroys living material because it breaks apart the um the bonds in your you know, in your system causes disruptions to your DNA and things like that, but it doesn't destroy the buildings because you get the neutrons that just go through the buildings um, and some of them will get embedded in the buildings, but now you have concrete with an extra neutron in it where if you have, or you'll you know disassociate some of the chemical elements in the concrete, but you won't shut down biological processes. So it's a way of basically killing people by radiation poisoning by disrupting their bodily functions. So it kills living creatures more than other things. That's my understanding of neutron bombs, so I don't do that. Um, how much radioactive spray into the atmosphere uh, during, during nuclear testing? Can it be top? Yeah, so there was an issue where um, the prevailing winds blow from the test site. Uh, where's my maps? Do I have the map anymore? No, I don't have the map anymore. The prevailing winds blow from the test site towards Utah, and so there was quite a bit of contamination. There's some... Uh, Native American, like Indian reservations between the border of Nevada and Utah, southern Utah, there were people that there were increased rates of cancer from the nuclear testing. Um, so that all uh, that all happened. So anyways, there we go. That's what we've got for today.